Hi, so this is the second video uh, in the series about uh, tensors, where eventually I'm going to explain um, how the mathematical definition of tensors gives rise to the definition of tensors in physics. Now, those of you who are coming from Michael Penn's channel and watch this, uh, you might want to skip this video on the next one, just because I'm going over basically the same stuff that he does there. The the uh, you know definition of, of like a free module and and the tensor product. But I'm doing it just like a little bit more um, uh, rigorously and just and a little bit more generally. So I'm going to be talking about um, R modules in this video. But uh, uh, don't don't totally freak out if uh, uh, you don't even know what an R module is, because what you can actually do to to still watch this video and and get away with understanding everything is whenever I write um, the word R module. Uh, you can just think of, say, a finite dimensional vector space over the real numbers. And everything I say in this video will still be true because, in fact, um, so if you don't know, you know, whatever the hell an R module is, um, vector spaces are just very particular cases of this. So, I mean, if you want, you could even, uh, you know, think about uh, whatever other favorite field uh, you have in these cases. I also will be speaking in some abstract nonsense and talking about like universal properties and stuff, but I'm going to try and pepper in some concrete examples uh, just to give you something to hold on to if you're not used to that sort of uh, discussion. Uh, now, the major benefit of uh, understanding free modules is that they're often a stepping stone to building things that we uh, want to build. So if you have some sort of special kind of structure and you want a module to have that sort of structure, a pretty typical way to go about about doing that is to first create a free module and then uh, you can quotient of out by the relations you want to be there. Um, and so we're actually going to see this in a very explicit sense when we build the tensor product because we're going to be like, oh, I want this module that has these certain properties. And the way that we're going to do it is by first creating a certain free module um, or vector space and uh, taking out some sort of quotient that gives it the, the properties that we actually want it to have. And the reason that we work with free modules to do this instead of taking like just some sort of other existing like modular vector space and quotienting out uh, is because it's sort of the freest possible way to create a module. By this, I mean that there's no uh, extra relationships between the elements. That's why it's free, right? It's just there's like no relationships between the elements. And then you can sort of quotient out and put in those, those relationships uh, that you want to be there. For a little more um, in, intuition on this, like let's say, for example, I had a, a, a set, uh, you know, A, B, C of just three elements, and I want to create uh, the free module on this. So th basically, the idea of uh, like a free module is that every element of your set um, is sort of like a, a, a one-dimensional subspace, gives you a one-dimensional subspace in this module vector space um, that's independent of, of all the rest. So uh, in some sense, the uh, the dimension of your space will be the, the cardinality of the set you start with. Um, although I do have to warn you, what I just said is not technically precise for R modules in general. For vector spaces, yeah, if you're thinking about the intuition from vector spaces. Uh, but the thing is, when we move to an arbitrary ring, things get kind of crazy. And uh, e e even those seemingly benign statements don't really hold. So uh, for example, if, uh, if one was to create, say, the, the free uh module over the real numbers with with respect to this set maybe I'll, I'll just call this capital a um if if you were to uh go through this process that i'm going to describe later in the video uh, you would find that just this is just isomorphic to the vector space r3 right so for each one of these a b and c we we have some sort of uh space corresponding to it and we glue those together um and so i'm saying that this is the the sort of freest way to do it um, because you could imagine, you know, let's say we had some sort of, um, you know, if we have just like the Cartesian product of the real numbers, right? Um, now we can put, we can put an R module, right? We can put a vector space structure on these pairs of numbers, right? It's just, it's just sort of the, the obvious thing we, we normally do, right? Like you, um, if you, if you have some uh, pair of numbers, A and B and C and D, like you define your, um, addition relation to simply happen in the components and and you know scalar multiplication in the obvious way, and so this is not an example of of the process of of creating structure with 
free modules because we're not really at, we're just using the existing structure or, or the existing elements in this set right so uh, by comparison if if you were to try and create uh, the free module um, right free vector space over the real numbers using this set well there's infinitely many elements um, in r cross r in fact there's uncountably many so the dimension of this uh, the dimension of this would, would be uncountable. So that is the difference between this way of, of, of uh, putting a module structure on some sort of, or, or vector space structure on some sort of uh, set using the existing elements and doing this free process. So anyways, uh, let's just, uh, let's get into the uh, actual um, definition here. Uh, this is where it's going to get a little bit of abstract nonsense, uh, but then I'm going to, you know, write down a concrete realization of this and, and sort of put it into motion. So we're going to define a free module here in terms of something that's called a universal property. This might be new to some of you that haven't thought uh, about category theory or, or homological algebra before, things like this. But the really nice thing about uh, universal properties in general is that um, it, it sort of allows you to guess what the right definition should be with an object that you're working with. Uh, so, for example, if you can write down what a product of groups means um, in a sort of categorical way and in, in a sense of a universal property, and then let's say you want to go and, and try and define what a product of manifold should be. Um, well, your guess is just you take the categorical structure and you can write it down um, in this sort of way. So, so let me say some abstract nonsense and we'll dig into it. So a, a free module, if, if we have some set um, A and we have some ring, again, you can just think of the real numbers, um, then we can create the, uh, we say that the, the free module, the free R module on A is an object uh, together with a map uh, from A, so we're going to call this, this map here J, such that if you take any R module, so you take something that you know to be an R module, and you take any function at all from the set A into the module N, then there is going to exist a unique map. So there will exist a map, and there will only exist one such map, which uh, uh, put an exclamation here for unique. So the condition is that this map has to be an R module homomorphism, right? Because we're, we're defining uh, the free R module to be an R module. This is an R module. So this is going to be a, a, a homomorphism of R modules. Or if you're thinking about vector spaces, a linear transformation. And it has to make this diagram uh, commute is what we would say in terms of uh, universal properties. So what I mean by that is simply that if you were to apply the map J to some element of A and then apply, uh, apply the map uh, phi, this would be the same as the map F, always, always, always uh, for any element. And so one of the other nice things about universal properties too is that if we can prove that such an object always exists for all of these sets, then we actually get uniqueness for free. Um, I'm not going to do that in this video, but maybe I'll make some more videos about uh, category theory in general and show you uh, why you can uh, always prove that these objects are unique up to isomorphism uh, from these definitions. So if you've ever seen, you know, the, the definition of like an infinite direct sum or, or a free groups, uh, this next definition probably isn't going to be too surprising uh, for you. If it is surprising, then uh, uh, just hang tight for a moment. Uh, so we're going to take, uh, if we have our ring, again, could be the real numbers, uh, we're going to define this a uh, direct sum over a set A. And we're going to define this object to be um, f is going to, it's going to be the collection of all functions which go from the set A into uh, this ring R such that um, only fine, f is non zero for only finitely many values. So sometimes, uh, sometimes we say that it has finite support. So, so. This is the collection of all functions from A to R. And no, even if this set A is, is infinite, 
then um, we're only looking at those functions, which you can only find some, some subset of, of A, uh, which is finite, and those are the only elements that F is, does not take zero, does not take on the value zero, right? The identity of, of your ring. Um, and so uh, my claim is that this is an R module. Um, I'm not going to go over the details too, too strong uh, uh, myself. I mean, you, you can just think, well, I mean, what would our addition be, right? If we had two such functions, um, F and G, you know, what is their addition? Well, of course, since we have addition in the ring, you would just define it to be F evaluated at A plus uh, G evaluated at A. Um, and the uh, uh, same thing with the, uh, the scalar multiplication. Um, it's literally just a multiplication in the ring, right? Uh, R acting on uh, some uh, F, well, uh, if you plug in some A, you're just literally going to multiply the result um, by A. That's what it gets sent to. The reason I bring this up is because uh, my claim is that this uh, gives us, um, um, so, so shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself this is an R module, um, and my claim is that this object gives us um, the, this is one possible model of the free module over A. So we need to uh, prove the claim. We need to prove that this, uh, this so-called uh, universal property holds. We have our, our F, R, A, and I claimed that there should be some sort of special uh, set map uh, coming from here called J. And so uh, J is going to be, uh, uh, so within these functions, uh, I'm going to define the function J sub A. Uh, and this is going to be the characteristic function of A. So what I mean by that is uh, this function, because remember this, uh, this set here is just a collection of all functions who uh, only take on a non-zero value at finitely many elements. Um, I'm going to define this to simply be equal to the identity in the ring um, if uh, X is equal to A, um, and uh, so I mean the multiplicative identity, and it's going to be zero otherwise, right? So uh, clearly this function does belong to this set because there's only one element that it's not zero at. Um, so it, uh, it obeys the rule, it, it belongs. We call this the characteristic function. And so my map J here, um, J is going to be uh, the function that takes in A and uh, returns the characteristic function of, of um, I mean, here, here, what I, uh, I, I, I want to put in this place for the, the commuting diagram is this, um, is this uh, direct sum that I've been discussing. So now, um, suppose we have, right, suppose we have some uh, element of this uh, direct sum. So this is some function that is a non-zero at finitely uh, many elements. Um, so just writing, uh, I'm going to write B A for the output value of G um, evaluated A for any A. This is just the, the notation I'm going to use to uh, keep track of these um, output values. Um, so notice then uh, there's only finitely many elements that uh, G is non-zero at. So let's call those A sub 1. A up to A sub N, just to give us a label to talk about them. Um, and now consider the sum where we're going to sum over all elements of uh, A. And uh, I'm gonna, gonna just write uh, uh, B sub A. So that's uh, per, you know, defined to be the value of G um, at this point. And I'm going to multiply uh, by J sub A. Uh, now, you might be concerned, right? What if A is an uncountable set? Does the sum even make sense? Um, well, yes, because uh, these B sub A, right, there's only finitely many uh, which are going to be non-zero. So this is actually a finite sum. So everything is, uh, is actually well-defined. Um, writing this out a bit more explicitly, it, it's going to be simply the sum from I equals 1 up to N of B sub A sub I uh, J a. But our, our function uh, j e evaluated at a, remember, this just sends it to the uh, corresponding uh, characteristic function. So this is just going to be uh, the characteristic function j sub a sub i. 
right? And now, um, if we imagine applying, let's let's feed some some value x in at this. Well, what's it going to be? Uh, either it's one of these. Uh, if it's not one of these a sub i, then all of these characteristic functions are going to be zero. The whole thing's going to be zero. Or um, so so it agrees with g at at those points. Or um, we see that it is going to be one of the a sub i, and it's then, uh, of course, for exactly one of the characteristic functions, at which point it will spit out b sub a sub i, which is precisely the value of g at a sub i. So in other words, we see that this gives us the exact same thing as, as g of x. So what's the point of all that? Well, we've now seen, right, we, we started with an arbitrary function g, and we've seen that now we can write every single function um, in this form. What's more is that this is a unique such representation. Uh, so in order to see this, imagine, if you will, that uh, we were trying to represent the zero function. Well, then it would have to be the case um, that each of these b sub i uh, or, or b sub a here is equal to zero, right? There's no other option if you if you just keep unpacking it um, until you you get uh, uh, over here and you apply it. The only way it's it's going to be you know uh, um, the only way it's going to be uh, zero is if each of these coefficients is zero. So that actually gives us the uniqueness of this representation um, because if you suppose that there were two differing uh, representations of this form, uh, you would uh, subtract them from each other. You would know that that would have to be the zero representation and then the difference between the coefficients are all zero and hence the coefficients are equal. All we really need to do then is, uh, again, looking at this, this universal uh, property diagram. So I have my, I have my R, um, uh, plus a, um, we've, uh, you should be able to convince yourself, uh, uh, as above it's an R module structure. We have this map, uh, J, we have this unique representation of our elements. And, uh, and now remember the property is that if I take just some arbitrary map of sets into some arbitrary R module, I need to come up with some map phi here, uh, which is unique and uh, it has to be an R module homomorphism. And if I compose it with J, it's got to uh, be the exact same map as F. Okay, uh, well, let's, let's go ahead and, and see what should we define it as. So, so we know that we can write every single element um, of this, uh, of this uh, potentially infinite direct sum in the following form, right? Um, and in a unique such way, so what we can do then is think about uh, how we want uh, phi to be a, uh, how we want it to act on these sort of elements. Well, remember, we, we want to keep in mind that this thing ought to be um, linear, right? So our, uh, uh, what that means is precisely we should be able to factor it through the sum and through the, the scalar multiplication. So um, what we should want in our definition is uh, for it to be the case that uh, this is equal to the sum of the uh, b sub a times phi uh, composed with j of a. And now, well, this doesn't really leave us with any options, does it? Um, because we know that we want a j and phi to compose to f. So we find that this has to be the sum over all a of uh, b sub a f evaluated at a. And this actually gives us the uniqueness of the map phi, right? We saw that that basically because we know, because we know that we need to have linearity and because we know that this composition has to be equal, um, we don't actually really have any choice. It's sort of baked into the definition here. Um, so the only thing left to check is that this is an actual um, R module homomorphism. Um, but I'm going to leave that to you, the, the audience. Um, I mean, you simply need to take uh, two representations of this form. And just using this, uh, this definition of the action of phi, just make sure you can add things together and scalar multiply through. So that's going to do it for today's video. Very sort of quick 
um, introduction to the idea of, of free modules. And if it all seems a little bit heady, um, the nice thing is we're going to see it in action in the next video. So uh, take care.